Good morning, and if you happy to have a copy of God's Word, I want you to take it out. Today, we are going to be in Luke chapter 14, and we're going to continue uh, in our parable series. Pastor Chris gave me this assignment, and uh, I- I'm excited to be here. Uh, I- I'm overwhelmed at times, but this is a great passage, and I think it... Um, has simplicity that can help us really hone in and focus on something this morning. And I've titled it, Your Place at the Table. And I want you to think for a second, uh, me and uh, some other people, uh, you know, uh, people on staff that we, we talk through messages, right? This doesn't come from me, but man, there's a lot, there's a team of us. And, and we were talking about this. And <laughs> have you ever noticed when you go to a restaurant with a group of people, how you pick your seat at the table? I don't know if you've ever done that. I don't know if it's just me, but I'm pretty shy if you can't tell. And when I pick my seat at the table, I typically pick it to be right in the center in the middle of everything, right? Because if, I, if I'm having a conversation with somebody and that conversation runs dry, I can go right to the next person and pick it right back up. But then there's other people who specifically pick their spot, like my wife, she's the complete opposite of me, praise the Lord, because the two of me would be crazy. And, and, but she'll, she picks her, her seat on the end because she loves one-on-one conversations. And so it's funny how we choose our seats at a table. And, and you don't realize the, the, the unconscious thoughts that go into, where am I about to sit at this table? <laughs> what kind of conversations do I want to have today? You know, uh, it, actually, there's etiquette to sitting at a table. I mean, I'm from Middleburg, so I don't really know etiquette that well. But, but it, I looked it up because I was curious. <laughs> so I did a little history on some etiquette. And they still do this today at, like, state dinners, royal dinners and stuff. And, and, and what they do is you have the, 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 the host will sit at the head of the table. And so I've got a table, imaginary table right here. And so the host will sit here. And did you know the guest of honor, the, 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 the seat of honor is at the host's right hand. And so you have the host, then you have the seat or guest of honor, and then you have the guest, and so we're gonna have a table of six. So you have the seat of honor, the guest, another guest, the second host, typically your wife or someone else that may be hosting a party, and then all the other guests. And and so as you think about these things today, we're gonna talk a lot about your seat at the table if you can't tell by the title slide. And there's, there's, there's formal dining situations that you do this, but, but a less formal dining situation would be, have you ever thought about your seat at Thanksgiving? I remember I come from a big family, and I remember the moment where uh, when you walk in and you see the adult table and you see the kiddie table. And it's a really big deal when you move from the kiddie table to the adult table because now you're bringing something to the table. And, and so there's these moments of, of there's the significance of our seat at the table and how we choose how we sit at a table. You know, another thing in my family, I, I'll stop talking about my family in just a second, but I'm trying to paint this picture. I promise I'm going somewhere with it. It's not just a story about Jeremy's life here. But even in my family, um, we don't take too many things too serious. But when we're all together on my mom's side, uh, my uncles, including my dad, have this competition. It's a friendly competition, but a competition nonetheless of who is going to be my grandmother's favorite son-in-law. And they so much are into this competition that they've made t-shirts for one another about who's at the top of the ladder in the family. So you have all the brothers-in-laws and all, all of my uncles and all these things. And this is my dad's shirt, so obviously he's going to be number one on this t-shirt. And so, but the competition is always who's going to be at the seat of honor at our family gatherings because they're my grandmother's favorite in that significant event. Because how often do we love to seat ourselves in the guest of honor spot? How highly do we think of ourselves at times when we show up somewhere and we place ourselves in that seat of honor because in our minds there's no one else more important than us. You're welcome, I'm here. Let's let's begin. That is a huge bug. Sorry. Wow. Let's continue. With that being said, let's open up our word this morning. And let's read Luke 14. We're going to start. There's two parables today, and they actually fit hand in hand. 
And so we're going to read them together, and then we're going to unpack them, and I'm going to give you some practical tools that you can use and, and, and some really important things. Let's read this together, starting in verse 7. It says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited. And when he noticed how they chose the place of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come to you and say, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say, friend, move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, this parable discusses the etiquette at a wedding feast. And I want you to think about a wedding. If you've ever been, uh, there's wedding etiquette that we still practice today. And there is a protocol for the placement of friends and family at a wedding. And you don't want to be that guy at a wedding who goes and sits in the front row when you're the friend of a coworker. And you have, you, you, but, but you have to have this social etiquette that reserves the front row for close family and, and, and that, that are seats of honor to be recognized by them. And even the seating of the reception, you see the bride and the groom and the bridal party and the immediate family all have places in the front. And you don't want to be the guy that goes and sits at table one when you belong at table 16. That would be awkward. And so there's this etiquette that he's saying. There's this humility that drives it. Don't place yourself somewhere that you don't belong. Don't think so highly of yourself that you place yourself, but allow the host, in this case Jesus, to advance or bring you up from the lowest seat to the seat of honor. You see, Jesus was advising people not to rush for the best place at a feast. You see, people are eager today to raise their social status, whether by belonging to the right group of people, dressing for success, driving the right car. I mean, truly, who are you trying to impress? You see, rather than aiming for prestige, look for a place where you can serve. You see, if God wants to, you to serve on a wide scale, he might be inviting you to a higher place at the table. You see, as Jesus continues to dine, because where the context in which these two parables take place, what he's doing is Jesus has gone and has been invited by Pharisees to dine with them. And so he's kind of gone into this situation where they're trying to trap him, and they're trying to get him to uh, uh, sin against the law. And so Jesus goes in and he's having these conversations with Pharisees that are trying to get him. And so he's continuing to give these pictures of things that they can understand. And so just as Jesus continues to dominate the Pharisee, we're going to move on. And the Pharisee, he had to further explain the significance of sending and accepting invitations. You see, we know that even in today's, cult uh, even in today's culture, it is so important to respond to an RSVP when sent one so that the, the, the guest or the host can adequately prepare for that event. You see, Jesus uses this experience in the following parable, starting in verse 12, to explain the significance of how we respond to his invitation. Let's read this together. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do you not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will, be, who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he being Jesus said, a man once gave a banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to these who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five, uh, five yoke of oxen and I, I must go to examine them. Please have me excused. 
And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Uh, uh, and, and so please have me excuse. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Let's pray today. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. I pray that as we talk through your word this morning, that you would bring clarity. God, remove me out of the way and speak through me today. God, that your word may convict us, change us, move us to be uh, conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you and we love you today, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. And so, just as Jesus was teaching these two lessons here, the first parable he spoke to the guests and he was telling them not to seek the place of honor. Don't think that you're better than what you are. You see, service is more important in God's kingdom than your status. I'll say it again in case you missed it. Service is more important in God's kingdom than your status. You see, the second parable, he, he told the host not to be exclusive about who he invited. You see, God opens his kingdom to everyone. God opens his kingdom to everyone. You see, the man was confused about why the position at the table would matter if they all received and were all going to be dining in the heavenly kingdom, but Jesus corrected him because he, was, he wrongly assumed that everyone had accepted the invitation to the kingdom. You see, in Jesus' story, many people turned down the invitation to the banquet because the timing was just simply inconvenient. You see, we too may resist or delay responding to God's invitation because it's just simply inconvenient. It, it, it sounds reasonable to tell God, well, God, I got work duties. I've got things I simply must do, and so I cannot accept you today. Or, or God, I have family responsibilities. I cannot accept your invitation today. God, financial needs are, are too many it's too crazy for me right now. God, I cannot accept your invitation. You see, nevertheless, God's invitation is the most important event in your life. And no matter how inconveniently it may be timed, he demands a response. And if you say no, that is your response. So are you here this morning? Are you making excuses to avoid responding to God's call because of situations or circumstances that may be in your life? Because I'm going to tell you the time might not ever be convenient. See, Jesus reminds us that the time will come when God will pull his invitation and offer it to others. And at that point in time, for those who were invited, that invitation was pulled and was never offered again. It will be too late to go to God's banquet. You see, both of these parables discuss a table. I don't know if you noticed that. Because they were dining. He was putting it in perspective for them. He was painting a picture that they could understand. It was practical. You see, the first one in verses 7 through 11, he, he's talking about this wedding feast. And he's literally saying, hey, how do you choose your seat at the table? Are you, are you putting yourself in the, the, the guest of honor spot? Are you thinking more highly than, than what you really should? So he's literally just talking about you and, and, and everyone around you at the table. But as he moves to the parable of the great banquet, he's not merely just talking about a wooden table. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternity. And so here is the point today. It's a one point. 
It, it, it's, it's, it, it's just like this. And I, if you remember anything, I want you to remember this. Quit worrying about your place at the table and focus on bringing people to the table. Stop worrying about your place or your status at the table. It doesn't matter if you're at the guest of honor spot. What we need to focus on is bringing others to the table, friends. You see how they're linked? Because if we don't humble ourselves and we stop thinking about us, then we're going to be able to start thinking about who's not at this table that needs to be at this table. You see how they're linked? I, I mean, you can't, you can't go to God's banquet if you think more highly of your status than others. Stop worrying. Quit worrying about your, pl your place at the table and focus on bringing people to the table. You see, the point of the first parable is this concept of humility. And, and it's this personal humility that, that don't take the best place at the table by thinking more highly of yourself and stop worrying about you and your position and the pride that is within you. You see, what this parable is talking about is, is not a new concept. It, it's something that we have dealt with since the beginning of time after the fall. Look, look at Luke 9 with me. This is talking about the disciples, and look at this. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Not a new concept. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me uh, and receives the one who sent me. For he who is least among you is also the one who is great. It's opposite. It's flipped. It's not about being at the head of the table. It's about being at the table. You see, the disciples didn't understand Jesus' words in this passage that we just read in Luke 9. They, they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about when it was coming to his death. They still thought that King Jesus meant that he was going to bring his kingdom and he was going to set a physical earthly kingdom up and they were arguing about who was going to be his right-hand man. They, they were more worried about their status in his kingdom than about everybody else that didn't know him. You see, our care for others is a measure of our greatness. How much concern do you show for others? You see, this is a vital question that I think can accurately measure your greatness in God's eyes, right? God, God cares for the least of these, so if you wanna be great, then care for the least of these. How have you expressed your care for others lately? especially the helpless, the needy, the poor, those who can't return your love and concern. See, see, often what we do is we're like, hey, if you do this for me, I'll bring you to the table because you're gonna repay me. It's got something in it for me. You see, Jesus is saying, hey, do it for those who can't repay you because your reward, like he said, will be when the resurrection comes. Hey, your return is gonna be in the future because you have hope. You, you know me. You see, your, your honest answer to that question of, of how, how do you care for others will give you a good idea of your real greatness from a godly perspective. You see, let me, let me take you back to my family's rivalry about who's the greatest son-in-law. You see, it's not really about who's the greatest son-in-law. I mean, my grandma gets a, a giggle out of it. I mean, it's funny. But really, what she cares most about in her family is how my uncles and my dad treat her daughters. How, how they care for their family. How they care for others. That's really, that's really what she's talking about. That's really what they're fighting over is, man, who can serve, who can serve the best? Who, who, who is, who's going to be able to do something that she needs? So it's not about who's the greatest. It's really about how are you serving others? 
You see, when it comes to our place at the table, when we look at verses 7 through 11, what we need to do is we need to let God elevate our status. We'll we'll allow God to elevate our status. In verses 12 through 14, we can let God repay our losses because as we know, we're giving and yet we're not receiving in return. And so we're going to allow God to repay what those who can't repay. See, it's not about if they can repay. It's about letting God do that. And in verses 15 through 24, man, we're going to let God manage the guest list. We're going to allow him to do it because here's the key. All the people that you think should be invited to the table probably won't accept the invitation. Do you see that? All the people that this guy invited to the banquet, what did they do? Did they accept? No. They bought land. They had to go check out some financial resources like their oxen. They got married. They had some relationship stuff going on. And so all the people that he thought should be invited to this banquet did not come. And here's the key. All the people who would want to be there don't even think they should be invited. And so what did the master tell the servant to go do? Go. Compel them to come and eat at my table. Don't worry about the repayment. Go and tell them. Go to the highways. Go to the byways. Go to, go to the city streets and tell them to come and eat from my table. And so here's the, the driving question that has been burning a hole in my heart. Is who are you inviting to the table, friends? Church, who are you inviting to the table, See, a while ago, I don't know if you remember, I can't remember exact times because I don't remember what I really did yesterday, but we did a church-wide Who's Your One. Do you remember that? And we came, and man, we were pumped. We had a huge wall of sticky notes about someone that was God laid on our hearts That was going to be our one that we were going to pray for. We were going to pray for opportunities to share the gospel to. We were going to bring them to church. Man, we were going to get our one. And some of us found fruit from that. Some of us were successful. Our ones came. They were saved. They now have a seat at the table, God's table. But here's the key, you might be like me today. I invited my one, I called my one. I haven't seen that fruit yet. I haven't seen that fruit yet. And I felt convicted because I was thinking about how long it's been since I've personally invited him back to experience God's table. I I, I realized that I can be so focused on me sometimes that I lose What God's trying to tell me that it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about them. Why do you think we tell you to go be the church out there? Because God's telling us to go and bring people to the table. So friends, who are you inviting to the table? You know, I want you to take a moment. I want you to even write that person's name down. And guess what? Here's the key. If your one came and they're at the table, what's another one? Think of, think of another one of someone that you can invite to God's table. I want you to think about them. I want you to write their name down. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads without falling asleep. And I want you, I want you to take 10 seconds and I want you to call this person's name out to the Lord silently. And I want you to pray for them right now. We're just going to pray over them. We're just going to, we're going to take this moment because if we're not worried about our place at the table, we're going to focus on bringing other people. But the, fir- the first way to do that is we got to think about, we got to identify who that person is. So let's not leave here today without thinking of who's that one person that we can invite to God's table. I want you to take a moment. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me. God, we, we lift these names up to you. God, we don't have to do a campaign in order to think of one person to invite to experience the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I pray that you would give each and every person in here today boldness to truly act and quit worrying about their place, but focus on inviting someone to experience your table. God, that they would come, that they would pray for them, they would share the gospel with them. God, help us be bold and courageous. Help us have the humility to quit thinking of ourselves. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You see, we know that there's people out there that need to be brought to the table. But God works. Here's the key. God works in and through you and me as believers to go and to bring them. So don't lose that. That's an action step, right? If you look, it's straight from Scripture. The, the, the master said, go and bring them, compel them. Compel them to come. Give effort. This is important. You see, I, I think as we come to a close this morning, I, I, this is so practical. I, I don't need to keep beating the same thing over and over, but I want to recognize that there are many people in this room that are coming from all different walks of life and different things, and sometimes we, uh, man, life is frustrating. And yet we feel that, uh, we, we feel the pressures of today. So maybe you're in here this morning. Don't, don't lose me just because I got one point. Some of, a, some of you may be in here this morning and, and, man, you are just simply worried about you and your position at the table. It's normal. We, we are tempted to do that. We are tempted to think more highly of ourselves than what we should. And, and maybe you're here and you're, you're like, I'm owed that, Jeremy. You don't understand what I've gone through. You don't understand the, the, the trials or the circumstances of my life. And I've earned that place at the table. It's not true. Jesus earned that place at the table. Because he died for you so that you didn't have to. We deserve death. We deserve that crucifixion. And so some of us might be in here and we've got to lose this idea. We've got to quit worrying about us and our place. We've got to quit worrying about our pride and our position of what other people may think. We've got to start focusing on others. If that's you this morning, I pray that you would seek God's forgiveness. And if that means you've got to come up here and you've got to lay it down, because Christ said that you are buried in his death, just like we did at Bap just like we represented in baptism, we were buried in his death and we are a new creation. That means it's not about you anymore. You're not your own, you're, you're God's. Maybe you need to come lay that down and get that right this morning. I pray that you will. I pray that you would stop seeing yourself more important because it's just simply life's not about you. And, and truly our hope and our hope in Christ is not based upon our circumstances that everything's gonna go right because it's just simply not. God doesn't promise that, but he does promise a seat at the table. And we're gonna go right into that because maybe some of you are here and maybe you're just not sure if you've ever been invited to the table. You might be here, Jeremy, I, I don't understand what it means to be invited. I, I've, never, I've never acknowledged that there was an invitation. I never saw one come in the mail. Well, let me tell you this morning that invitation has a name, and that name is Jesus. And Jesus died. Jesus came, first of all. He left the splendor of heaven. He came and lived perfect. He didn't sin in word, thought, or deed. And he died in your place on a cross. And because of the blood that was shed on that cross for you and for me, 
That is the invitation because three days later, he didn't stay dead. He rose so that we could walk in newness of life. He is the invitation. And here's the greatest part of it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You can't pay enough money. That's why money doesn't give you to heaven. It's an act of worship because you're putting God before your finances. So you can't earn it. You can't work for it because it's already been paid. So all you have to do to receive the invitation to have a seat at God's table for eternity in a place called heaven is your belief, your trust, that what he says is true. That what he did really happened. That's all. That's, that's all it is. It's your belief. It's mind-blowing at how simple it is. And yet, it's so hard because we have to put ourselves aside. God is offering you an invitation today because that invitation is key. You recognize that you're broken because of your sin and that sin separates you from a holy, all-purpose God and all he wants you to do is trust in the saving work of his son Jesus on the cross. And so if this is you this morning, please don't leave. I am compelling you not to leave until you get this figured out. Accept the invitation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I don't want you to spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. I want you to be at God's table with me. Because you call on the name of the Lord and believe in your hearts that Jesus is Lord. You see, maybe you're here this morning and you're a little different. You're on the complete opposite end here. And maybe you're here and you know God. But there's someone that you need to invite to the table I pray God would break your heart because of what breaks his, and that's lost people. I pray that God would give you the courage to go and to tell. I pray that your one act of obedience would keep someone else out of hell. You telling them about the gospel, the fact that Jesus came, died, and rose again, will keep them from eternity in hell so that they can have a place at God's table. But what it's going to cost you is the fact that you got to quit worrying about your place and you got to start focusing on bringing other people to the table. Because here's the key, don't miss this. You don't own the guest list because it's to everyone. You aren't the master of the guest list because you're not the one who died for it. And God wouldn't invite the people that you would because we're sinful and we can't handle it. So bring people to God's table. Bring people to the God who can save them.